In this week, we're going to look at how to deal with complex eigenvalues, which can easily arise. And we're also going to look at more applications of these systems in contexts. So as a brief reminder, we're looking at the system of equations x prime as a vector equals some matrix times the unknown vector x again. We know from experience that this leads to looking for eigenvalues. And those eigenvalues come from the characteristic polynomial. When we compute the eigenvalues, we get a polynomial. And of course, one of the options or possibilities when we have polynomials is that we might get complex or non-real roots. Just as a quick point on notation, we're going to use the letter i instead of the square root of negative 1. This is more traditional, and by now we've hopefully gotten used to the idea of this square root of negative 1 being a concept that's handy or useful, even though all our solutions here are real. So what are we going to do when we have a linear system and we end up with non-real eigenvalues? Well, the solution is fortunately very simple to what we've seen before. We are going to get a combination of a real part and an imaginary part. So this is our R value here. And alpha is the real part. And beta is the imaginary part. Notice it has that I multiplier, which indicates that it is the imaginary part. We're also going to get eigenvectors that have real, the A part, and the imaginary part B. And those are also going to play a role. When we work with those, we're going to get two solutions. We have two R values, so this would be R1 and R2. We're going to need two solutions out of that. Let's call them X1 and X2 as vectors. And those are going to be exactly what you'd expect. The real part goes into the exponential. The real part goes into the exponential. The imaginary part of the eigenvalue goes into the frequency or the sine and cosines. That's exactly what we had before, no difference. The new part is all of this. So this is new in some sense, at least a new form. In the past, we would have simply had e to the alpha t cos of beta t if we wanted the same terminology and another one e to the alpha t sine of beta t. Because there are eigenvectors involved, we have the cos a minus sine b and the sine a cos b. We'll see how this formula plays a role as we go forward. This is far easier to see in the context of an example. So let's take a look at this linear system here where the A matrix that defines the system is given as negative 1, 2, negative 1, negative 3. Looking at this, there's nothing special that says, I'm going to have complex eigenvalues. So we just proceed with our usual routine of finding the solutions and just reminding ourselves that what we're assuming is that our x of t is equal to e to the lambda t times some vector. So underlying all the work we're doing here is this assumption that's built in. That assumption led to the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. And so our first step then is to find the eigenvalues of a, because those eigenvalues go into the exponential in principle. To find those eigenvalues, we set the determinant of a minus ri equal to zero. The determinant of a minus r down the diagonals, that should equal zero. In this particular case, it's negative one, two, negative one, negative three, and negative r down the diagonals. To get the determinant, we take that cross product, positive this way, so negative one, negative r, negative 3, negative r, minus the product the other way, negative 1 times 2. That leads to 3 plus 3r plus 4r plus r squared plus 2, or r squared plus 4r plus 5 equals 0. Again, this is our characteristic polynomial, and it has roots. And those roots are going to dictate the flavor of solutions we get. So we look at this characteristic polynomial and we say, well, I can't factor it easily. So we'll resort to the quadratic formula. That will give us the R values fairly easily. Negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 4 squared minus 4 times 5 AC 
all over two a's, which is the one coefficient up front. That's going to be negative two plus or minus a half. The square root of 16 minus 20 is negative four. So there's our indication that we're going to have complex roots because we have that negative sign underneath the square root. And so that'll be negative two plus or minus. Well, if we bring this half inside, it's gonna become a four under the square root. And we're gonna have the square root of negative one or minus two plus or minus one i. That's the cleanest way to write that. Those are our values for the eigenvalues. In the terminology used earlier, that would be our alpha and the one, not the one i, just the one, the coefficient is going to be our beta. And it's worth noting that technically e to the minus two plus i all times t is a solution. If you're willing to accept complex numbers in your solution. But if we're trying to predict something about a real system, then we should have values that are clearly defined for all t as real values. So we don't like it because it's not an all real solution. So it's more a preference than something that's actually wrong with this. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what we can do next. We have our eigenvalues and notice this is two eigenvalues. So what we're gonna do is find the eigenvector for the R equals alpha plus b beta i. Matrix theory comes to our rescue here and says if these eigenvalues have a plus and minus complex conjugate relationship, so too will the eigenvectors. So we do get uglier vectors, but we do save some time by only needing one of those eigenvectors. The vector for r equals alpha minus beta i will be the complex conjugate of this. So we find the eigenvector for this root, and then we're going to find the other one automatically for free. The downside is the calculations tend to be a little bit uglier. What we need to solve is a minus ri times some vector v equals the zero vector. That gives us negative one minus minus two plus i and two, negative one, negative three, minus minus two plus i. So we just treat i as a constant that we can't really simplify except when we get i squareds. When we get i squareds, we get negative ones, which is handy. Again, the whole point is i is the square root of negative one, so we square it, we get back to negative one. v1, v2, and we're just gonna to try to simplify this. So this has to equal zero. Our matrix then becomes one plus, negative one plus two, which is plus one, minus i, two, negative one, negative one, minus i here. Now here, it's not obvious, though it's true, but it is true that one row is redundant. In terms of a system of equations, we don't need one of these rows because it would cancel out as we uh, multiplied through or did row operations. So the best we can do here is just pick one of the rows arbitrarily. Let's take the first one. One minus i v1 is plus two v2 equals zero. When we have this kind of form, we can't, well, we can with some practice, but it's easier just to plug in some values now and see what happens. So let's let uh, v1 equal one and see what happens. If we do that, then two v2s are going to equal negative one plus i, and v2 is going to be a half negative one plus i. And that gives us our eigenvector, 
which is going to be v1, so 1, and then negative a half plus a half times i. We'll work with that on the next page. Now my personal preference is here is just not to have fractions. What we can do as long as we scale everything the same way is multiply everything through by 2 and that'll give us the cleaner looking eigenvector of 2 minus 1 plus 1i and that we can rewrite just look at the first term there's a real part it's a 2 how many i's are there in that first part there are none so there's no i's in the second component there's negative 1 with no i and there's a plus 1 with the i and that gives us the a and the b from the formula we were told earlier for how to handle complex conjugate roots or eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Recalling that this eigenvector came with the root negative 2 plus i from some matrix theory, we could also guarantee that the second vector here, which would be 2, negative 1, this thing copied, minus the 0, 1, i is the eigenvector for the other root, r2 equals negative 2 minus i. So flipping the sign of the imaginary component flips the sign of the imaginary component on this eigenvector as well. Turns out that really isn't required because all we need to build our solution is the eigenvector for the original plus i here with this a and b. So what we're going to do is simply use that formula to build the general solution. What we need are two solutions that are literally independent of one another. That's what this formula gives us. And so we get x of t. It's going to be a bit long, but here it goes. Some constant times the first solution. So e to the, what are our alphas and betas? Alpha is negative 2, beta is plus 1. So we have e to the negative 2t times cos of 2t, sorry, cos of 1t, cos of t, times the vector a, which is the real part here, 2, negative 1, minus the sine of t, so the same frequency, and it's the same frequency for both solutions, what changes is the eigenvector that we use with it, or part of the eigenvector we use with it. Now it's the 0, 1 vector. And that's done. And we'll add a second solution, e to the negative 2t. This time we'll order to sine t and cos of t. And all we do is we swap the eigenvectors, or components of the eigenvector, the real and imaginary ones, in this formula, and we use a plus sign next. So it's unfortunate that we have all this notational complexity, but at the end of the day, what we get with these two solutions is some combination of oscillations, e to the negative 2t, damped oscillations, sine t, giving us the frequency of those oscillations. Now, because we've done something new here, it makes sense to verify that our solution is actually correct. This is going to be a little hairier than before because we're going to have product rule stuff happening, but it's certainly doable. The left-hand side of our differential equation up here is simply the derivative. So the left-hand side is going to equal negative 2 e to the negative 2t times all of the material inside. So we're going to use a product rule. We've taken the derivative of the first. And then we're going to add the first times the derivative of the second, which will be negative sine 2, negative 1, minus the cos of t times 0, 1. This definitely needs some simplification, so let's gather like terms. Let e to the negative 2t times cos of t. We have a 2 and negative 2, that's going to be negative 4. And over here, we have a 0. And then we have negative 2 times negative 1, that's plus 2. And a negative 1 here, like so. 
then we're going to have the sine t term. Negative 2 times negative sine is going to be positive of 0, 2. And we also have a negative here, so it'll be a negative 2 plus 1 here. And that's our solution. This would simplify down to negative 4, 1. And this would simplify down to negative 2, 3. What does our right-hand side equal? So that's this term over here. Our right-hand side is the matrix negative 1, 2, negative 1, negative 3 times x, which is e to the negative 2t, common factor, times, this is our solution again, so this is x1 coming in here and being imposed or being used as a value. We multiply that simply by x as it is, 2, negative 1, minus sine of 0 and 1. There we go. And what does that equal? Well, we get e to the negative 2t out front. Check. Then we're going to have cos terms cos t terms, and those are going to be negative 2, negative 2 is negative 4, and negative 2 plus 3 is 1. We'll take a look at what we had before, negative 4, 1 to go with the coses. What about the sines? Here we have the 0, 1 vector times this matrix, so we end up with 2, and negative 3 times 1, negative 3. Does that match this? Ah, it does. If we are willing to bring in this negative sign, then we get the negative 2, negative 3. And those are now equal. So we give ourselves a big check mark, and we found that x1 is a solution. So that construction that we made with these various combinations of the vectors turns out to be very important. We can't do without those and still get a solution. If we were missing the cos or sine and took the derivative, all bets would be off in terms of what we get. So it's important that we have that form from the previous page to construct our solutions. This combination of solutions with cos and sine, sine and cos, and the real and imaginary parts of the vector, this a and the b from our eigenvector.